Yeah, welcome to Nairobi this uh, Friday morning. And I'm really happy that we have the time to talk to Dr. Alex Awiti. Alex Awiti is the director of the East African Institute at the Aga Khan University in Nairobi and Kenya. And uh, we will talk about the coronavirus epidemic and its consequences for the African continent. And what we observe in the last couple of weeks is that slowly the epidemic is, um, um, is not um, um, uh, any longer the center of uh, Europe and other uh, countries in the global north, but now has also arrived in, on the African continent and mainly South Africa is becoming the, one of the next hotspots of this pandemic. Um, but overall, the African continent is less affected by the coronavirus pandemic than everybody expected before. The total number of uh, COVID-19 cases and deaths is much lower than in Europe or North America, despite to a higher population. So Africa has currently about 1.2 billion people when I know that right. And I was wondering, what are the reasons for that? Was this this early shutdown or the experiences with other pandemic like uh, Ebola, the young population, less global mobility? What, what can you tell us about this? I think, uh, thanks, and uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you again, <clears throat> um, except that this is kind of a strange time to, to be having a conversation because of all the problems that we're seeing around the globe. Uh, but nevertheless, so the African pandemic structure, the, the, the epidemiological structure is very different from what you've seen in Europe, uh, what we're seeing in South America as well, and what we saw in North America, what we're seeing in North America as well. I think part of the reason is that there is very little connectivity to the rest of the world between Africa and the sources of where the, the source points of the disease as we know it, which was the whole global struggle. Uh, from Wuhan into Europe, uh, into the Middle East, and then into Africa. So if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the international flight kind of activity, international travel activity, uh, South Africa is one of the biggest hubs on the continent. And then Egypt, and then Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, and then Ethiopia and Kenya, and maybe uh, uh, Yaoundé and Cameroon. Uh, and, 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 the, and Kinshasa and the DR Congo. So when you look at the early waves of this pandemic, uh, these were the spots where it went. Uh, and now it's unfortunate that South Africa is, is flaring, uh, is flaring up. Egypt is also pretty high. Um, and uh, so that's one factor. The other factor that uh, has contributed to a very slow onset of the disease on the continent mm -hmm. is, uh, is its very youthful population. Uh, which I guess in, 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 in very many circumstances kind of leads to this phenomena where there's a very high proportion of COVID positive people who are asymptomatic uh, and do not present with critical illness and, 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 uh, or severe or even moderate disease. Uh, so that's also another important factor. I think the other point is also that uh, the early steps in lockdown were also critical because I think they learned from the lesson. They learned the lesson from China, and uh, given the experience with Ebola, there is no government that was taking this uh, lightly because they know what has happened in the past. And for instance, if you look at the early actions of President Museveni, President Kagame, uh, yeah. Uhuru Kenyatta, these were very deliberate, methodic early action. In some fact, some people actually thought that it was an overreaction, but it was the right reaction at the right time. Uh, we're now seeing massive community spread, of course, with more testing and all of that. Uh, but I think that first rapid uh, catastrophic wave did not happen on the continent because of these early actions, but also the fact that Africa is just not so well knit into the global travel uh, nexus. 
Yeah, this is uh, for me. It's really interesting to hear that because in German newsletter a couple of weeks back, you could uh, could always see the big headlines. There will be a huge catastrophe in Africa. Everything will break down. Things like that. And I was wondering if this is also kind of narrative being part of what Fervin Saar uh, called Afro pessimism. Would you agree on that? Uh, so I, I think sometimes Africa is underestimated. Uh, the resolve, the resilience, the capacity of, of the people uh, to rally and, 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 and respond to what is a truly catastrophic uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. But you've now seen the actions taken by, and governments have gone different ways. So uh, uh, the government of Rwanda moved very rapidly, pushed everything online, shopping, had a very, they have a very, very, intensive and, 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 and robust uh, uh, digital tracking mechanism, which you have to get into the portal, apply for permission to get out of your house, you have to state where you're going and all of that. So they moved everything online. So you can now shop online, you can do most of your work online. It, it is very different from Tanzania, which basically just said, look, you know, the disease is there, you guys go out there, take precautions. So Tanzania now is the first East African country to open its schools and universities and permit social gatherings, including churches and funerals. And yet I've just been speaking with one of our colleagues from Tanzania. He says, yeah, the spots of disease, as you expect in any other place, but we're not dropping dead uh, from this pandemic. Uh, so I, I think in a lot of ways, we also kind of just didn't think that Africa is sufficiently prepared to, to deal with a, a pandemic of this scale. Uh, and there's a lot of internal learnings from previous pandemics, uh, like Ebola, for instance, the HIV and AIDS crisis. Uh, so there's a lot of social resources and then social capability uh, that then can mobilize society to respond uh, to a disease of this scale. Do you see the risk that the uh, target group of measures that have been taken, uh, for example, when you mentioned Kanga, uh, Kagame in Rwanda, he developed online shopping. This is more or less the target group of the middle class, isn't it? So isn't the poor population at high risk not to be focused in uh, in these measures that have been taken by the presidents of several African countries? Uh, I don't think it's really elitist because uh, one of the things that Kagame has also done, you know, the mobile, uh, the internet penetration in Africa is also quite considerable, which is something that a lot of people don't understand. But even just a, a short code message from a, from a text to like the, the portal, the government portal where you get permission to leave your house, you don't need mm -hmm. You don't need broadband to do that, uh, to send a short, a short message code to your nearest grocery. You don't need broadband internet to do that. So there's a lot of innovation uh, mm -hmm. that is happening in, in the societies that is, is, is basically helping the continent to leapfrog this catastrophe and still kind of maintain a, a, a very credible sense of, of normalcy as, as far as this can get. I see. So I would like to go step um, to the past and talk about the former HIV AIDS crisis um, where we could ex uh, observe that uh, some African president who negated or downplayed the dangers, now you can observe um, a development like this and more in countries like Brazil, for example, or in other countries where uh, thousands of people um, are on risk to lose their lives by negating the dangers that we can see. And I was wondering, are we ex experiencing a kind of new responsibility for the concerns of the population or is this, or is this uh, um, how can you say, a transfiguring view? when it comes to Africa. I think there's a huge difference between Latin America on the one hand side and Africa on the other hand side. And the African presidents, as you already explored, are doing a much better job. Yeah, so I think you know this is really an existential challenge. And I think part of the reason why governments have reacted the way they have reacted is the, the public knowledge out there about the fragility of, Af of Africa's health system is, is a big factor in how governments have reacted. So the governments have taken the approach that you, you're better off preventing an all-out catastrophic surge of the disease. So focus on lockdown measures, 
trying to minimize the the uh, the infections to a point where you can actually deal with them given your uh, healthcare infrastructure capacity. Mm -hmm. So 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 that that has been a cautionary uh, dynamic to to how African governments have responded to this. And in the very beginning, came out they're wearing masks and they're saying this is a problem. In places where there was denial, uh, like Burundi, for instance, we've had some serious catastrophe there. Uh, you know, nobody knows whether the the they had com the, the cardiac complications that uh, the president of Burundi succumbed to uh, were attributed to COVID. But there's a lot of uh, reliable information out there that the senior echelons of the Burundi power structure uh, has been COVID positive. Uh, uh, the, the, the president's wife was hospitalized in, in, here in Kenya and has recovered and has, and has since returned home. So you, you can see instances where the governments were very basically careless and reckless, and the disease has gone to the to, to the heart of the power structure. Um, I think one of the other things that is also critical is that we haven't seen the kind of reckless, uh, uh, kind of irresponsible behavior of African leaders, such as what you saw with Yaya Jami of the Gambia, who basically said, yeah, you could drink some concussion or something like that and get cured of AIDS and all of that. So that kind of recklessness, that's kind of in the past. Uh, and I think we've seen a much more serious uh, African leadership structure that has been very responsive to the pandemic. And I think the African Union has also been at the forefront saying this is an important uh, juncture in our lives uh, as a continent and we need to think about how to protect our populations. Yeah, talking about the African Union, I find it really interesting to see that these broader questions when it comes to uh, ideas how to develop health systems on the African continent, like for example, uh, debt reduction and other issues were on the, uh, are on the uh, international agenda now. And they're very interesting concepts uh, and ideas coming on behalf of the European Union. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit on this issue? Um. I think what the African government, what the African Union is trying to figure out is how can they be kind of the trusted broker of ideas and resources onto the continent? How can they help to organize uh, Africa's engagement with the West uh, and with other development partners, including China, uh, North America, Latin America? Uh, and I think that cooperative, collaborative approach to solving the problems of a very large, diverse continent uh, is important. Uh, so governments can then pick and choose the the, uh, the the details of the of the bilateral relationships that they form, but that the gateway is one is one voice that basically uh, through the agenda 63 for the continent that sets out the big priorities uh, where the continent should go. Uh, it is not perfect. Uh, there, there are still teething problems with the structural uh, with the structural and institutional character of, of the African Union Commission, for instance. Uh, but a lot of discussions are going on in terms of even how to fund the African Union to be able to deliver on its mission. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting progressive conversations. And as you know from your experience in Europe, uh, building a, a, a continental structure for, for collaborative collegial governance is, is, is extremely complicated. Uh, national states will still rise and, 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 and fall prey to, to the attraction of sovereignty and, and, and whatever else it promises. So. Uh, it's really work in progress, and uh, at this point, we can say the African Union is is on the right path. It is, yeah. When we come to the development of um, the vaccine against uh, COVID nineteen, I think it's, it, it uh, fits into what you said before that there is more a national strategy coming up. That there are too many countries who focus on their own population and thinking that this will be kind of the solution uh, to focus on their own uh, countries. And the uh, European Union is um, decided to have a kind of mixed uh, strategy. On the one hand side, they are continue to finance WHO structures in a very positive way. They increase the money for the WHO but on the other hand side, now they come up with a kind of strategy, what we can maybe call EU first light when you compare it with the US. Yes. So they tried also to finance um, the European pharma industry 
to develop uh, a vaccine against COVID-19 and make sure that European citizens get it first. And uh, to us, as a, as a human rights and um, development organization, this is a huge problem that we can see that the idea of health as a common good and the question of a fair contribution is not longer on the agenda. And I think that, uh, and I was wondering which role the African Union or African governments could play to um, come up with another strategy that includes a more global perspective. Do you think that this might be a chance to make a change uh, in the situation that we are facing now? So, and that's a very good question, but I think it also speaks to the, uh, uh, the unfortunate deterioration of, of global governance uh, at a multilateral level. And all of the efforts that you know you and I can spend hours talking about the the uh, the, uh, the deliberate attempts by say the United States uh, current leadership to undermine uh, multilateralism, uh, and I think that is 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 a critical question, especially when you have to think about how can we as a global collective deal with a pandemic of this magnitude uh, that basically is ravaging every country, rich, poor, middle old, young, uh, et cetera. And I think what we're seeing now is, you know, given that this is truly unprecedented and, and, and the fact that the rise of the vaccine, thanks to modern biotechnology, we can now really expedite the process uh, to, 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 to go to trial. Uh, we now have a trial that has started in South Africa, uh, in the UK and in Brazil. And I think this is important because Africa now really has a stake in that vaccine trial conversation. Uh, it, it may not come to Kenya, it may not come to any country uh, across the border from here, but it puts the African population in the conversation as, as having been part of this uh, bold initial wave of, of an attempt to find a vaccine. Uh, so I think it, it, it helps to reset the conversation. Uh, it says that, look, uh, you know, we, we matter here as well, and we're contributing to the uh, the mobilization of scientific evidence on the efficacy of a vaccine. And then and, and God knows whether we, we have more than three strains of the COVID uh, virus. Uh, and I think the, the, the structure of the trial that makes it really interesting to be able to kind of figure out whether there will be some specific strains that are already developing uh, and becoming autonomous uh, uh, in the region in terms of the, the structure of the, of, of the disease and how it affects Human. So I think it's a very important conversation to keep having. Uh, how do you balance in an ethical way and from a human uh, rights perspective, the fact that uh, we are all in this together and any flare up of the virus, any vulnerability to COVID anywhere on the globe basically reverses any gains that we might make. So and, and it's not going to be possible to contain one set of population in one corner of the world and say, everybody else is fine except these people because disease is basically transmitted by humans and it is by contact. So I think in this situation, we've got to think about this as a global health security question, not sovereign kind of uh, uh, preoccupations uh, of governments to keep their population safe. Any person unsafe anywhere is a threat to global health security everywhere. Thank you so much. This fits perfectly into uh, the call by more than, I think, 100 African intellectuals for the coronavirus pandemic. I would like to quote uh, one passage of this um, call is saying, more crucially, it is essential to remember that Africa has sufficient material and human resources to build a shared prosperity of an egalitarian basis in respect of the dignity of each and every one. The death of political will and the extractive practices of external actors can no longer be used as excuse for inaction. We no longer have a choice. We need a radical change in direction. Now is the time. And I would like you to comment on this too. As, as my last question, 
because uh, I don't remember that I read something so progressive and also so optimistic in the last couple of years coming from uh, uh, from um, a group of intellectuals uh, putting together their ideas and coming out with this statement. Yeah, well, I, I think this is this is uplifting in, in, in many ways. I think it, it recognizes the both the geopolitical uh, dynamic, but it also puts onto focus the African leadership itself, the political will of local governing organizations, local governing elite. Um, and my own perspective has always been that there is one crucial millstone on the on the neck of the African, uh, so to speak, in in in, in a pluralistic way, uh, and, and that has been the governor's incapacity on the continent, uh, the leadership failures on the continent, the lack of uh, bold, aspirational, ambitious plans to move the, the continent forward exactly on uh, that, that trajectory of shared prosperity and an egalitarian society, as, as if you think about that as a, as a continuum. Uh, and I think that is no fault of any external actors singularly, but there is some path dependence and a history that might speak to how we got here. And I think it speaks back to the colonial days and uh, the, 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 the nature of the processes that led to independence on the African continent. Uh, not a lot of attention that was paid to state and organizational capacity development so that the first founders of the African states did not have the capacity to run a modern state. Uh, they came from you know, very small, uh, unevenly organized uh, uh, small societies. And then they come into this big collective with all the trappings and the structures of a Western model of, of, of political and governmental organization in which they just didn't understand what they were supposed to do. Uh, and you see the early failures of the first uh, leaders of the continent uh, in Ghana, in Nigeria, uh, uh, in a lot of West African countries were em em embroiled in coup d'etats in Central Africa, Republic as well. Um, and and it, is, it has never really stopped until uh, the more recent times when the populations got more educated and, 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 and more activist about how do we build shared prosperity? How do you hold local leaders accountable? What are some of the ideas around which to galvanize a national vision uh, to achieve these goals, to build the essential social infrastructure, health, education, civil liberties, and, and all of these things are critical uh, to, to, to building a cohesive, uh, prosperous and, and egalitarian society. So I think we, you know, the, 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 uh, the Africa rising moment uh, that, that we've all been talking about uh, is, is, is a crucial, uh, it is a crucial visual uh, conception of an Africa that is now be becoming of age, that whose structures are now beginning to settle. And then we talked about the AU as now providing in its kind of messy, incomplete way, a sense of accountability to local leaders. Uh, we've seen AU call leaders who try to wrestle power in non-democratic ways. Uh, the Sudan question has been uh, a very serious sticking point, but again, you see the external forces meddling, but if you, AU had its way, they'd basically say no to the, to the political structure in, in Sudan and say they're illegitimate. Uh, but again, you have questions about uh, 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 Al-Bashir's track record, human rights record, and all of that. So we're still in this kind of messy situation. But I think uh, the general arc of progress is, is, is hopeful. Good to hear that. Thank you so much for talking to me this morning. Um, I really appreciate it. And as always, I learned a lot from you, talking to you. And I wish you a wonderful day. And uh, let's stay in touch. Thank you so much, Anne, and have a, have, a, have a good afternoon and have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.